Hi, welcome to episode two of The Crossbench, uh, the weekly political chat show hosted by Moore United where we try and find common ground on divisive issues. It's been uh, another hot, well, the first hot week for a while in the UK, but a sizzling hot weekend. Uh, we've got two leadership campaigns still rumbling on uh, with the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative Party. Um, we're going to be talking this week about another of the issues being ignored because of Brexit, although perhaps the one that's being least ignored in climate change, which we'll come to in a little while. But I'm joined uh, this week by Sean Berry, who's co-leader of the Green Party, uh, Gareth Thomas, uh, the MP for Harrow West and More United Network member, yep. uh, and Vera Hobhouse, MP for Bath. Is that right? Did you have City of Bath in your title, Vera? Or you just it Bath? is a city. But the, the constituents, is it it's City of Bath? It's just MP for Bath. MP for Bath. A lovely, beautiful part of it. <coughs> Um, I wanted to start off by asking, we've seen um, Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson seem to have found the magic money tree uh, and are now able to make spending commitments that haven't been allowed for a little while. Uh, and it's good news perhaps that the, the Chancellor has been planning for us to have some headroom should Brexit occur. But I wanted to start out by asking each of you to give me something that if spending was no briefly, if spending was no object... Uh, what would you choose to put a big chunk of government spending behind right now? Um, and you, uh, hopefully you will all avoid giving me the same answer for now. Uh, I'll start with uh, Vera. Since I'm sure you're going to say absolutely what are we going to do about climate change, I would say into housing. I think one of the biggest problems um, that people face and why their budgets are so squeezed is because housing is just so expensive. So I would like the government to build at least 100,000 new social homes for rent, um, and it should be in the public sector, it should be managed by the public sector, we could control the rents, and housing could be truly affordable, not what um, the current position is. And do you have a feeling, do you have a sense of what these houses should be, what kind of houses they, are they oh, and, and, then, and then we obviously if we build them, there should be net zero, of course. Mm -hmm. Council yeah. houses. Council houses. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, Gareth? Well, I like the idea of uh, housing, but I come from the sort of cooperative uh, tradition. So I think I'd quite like 100,000 uh, cooperative uh, housing where instead of people being dependent on their council to set rent levels and get work done to them, the uh, individuals who are living in those uh, houses can run them themselves, determine their own rents, determine when work gets done, etc. That's right. Fantastic. Can I just agree with both? Is that right? Yeah, we're we're going this for it. Going for it. <laughs> Completely. Um, there's been an analysis recently of how much money London needs to build the houses it needs. Um, and it's billions every year. At the moment, the, we're terribly proud that we've actually managed to wring about five billion out of the government for, for affordable housing subsidies, that some of which are council now and work before. Um, but it's billions and billions every year that need to go into that. And I love co-ops. I absolutely oh, good love them. Um, and there isn't enough going on. They're, they're all being treated as experimental. And I think coming from the cooperative movement, you'd agree that, that actually co-ops are quite an old tradition. Um, there's lots of examples of them working really well. And there's no need to sort of use pilot programmes, all these like dodgy things that are going on at the moment. We could... We could actually do co-ops at scale right now. Can I just say something, because I'm, as I am re representing the beautiful city of Bath, I used to be a councillor for 10 years in Rochdale, so a completely different area. And there... Um, and Rochdale uh, the, is the home of the co-op movement. Indeed, it's the home of the co-op movement. And um, actually the council then, uh, run by the Lib Dems at the time, if I, if, uh, if I may say that, although we are not party political, but uh, we, we made um, the whole of the social housing stock was transferred into a cooperative. So it is run now by a cooperative. So it would actually be quite interesting to see how they're doing. I haven't recently, so I shall. Well, this is a bit, one a great place to go if you're interested in co-op housing, and it pains me to say it as a North Londoner, is the Oxo Tower on the south bank of the River Thames. And uh, the Oxo Tower is completely uh, refurbished by a sort of social enterprise in the local community. And there's five floors there um, of social housing that are run as a housing co-op, Redwood Housing Co-op, some of the lowest rents in London in what everybody recognises is one of the prime spots. So if Cold Housing can work there, why not everywhere? So the three of you have done a brilliant job at arriving at agreement very early on, which is very <laughs> on brand. Uh, and I, uh, I know we're going to talk about climate change. So I wonder if I could throw another question at you and reverse the question. Uh, and let's assume that the, uh, the purse strings are still very tight. If you were to identify an area where we currently spend a lot of money, I know it's a difficult question to ask a politician, <laughs> um, and you think perhaps we don't need to be spending quite so much. What would you pick? Uh, what would you pick as something that we don't need to be spending quite as much money on at the moment? 
John, you've got an answer already. Um, yeah, I've got loads. <laughs> um, Subsidising fossil fuels, um, HS2, and uh, expanding road building. Um, all of those things between them are getting on for like £100 million pounds that we're spending. Um, fossil fuels is £10 billion a year. We're the, we're the highest subsidiser of fossil fuel industries in the EU at the moment. Um, our subsidies for renewables are less than our subsidies for fossil fuels, which makes no sense. Um, and Germany's subsidies for renewable energy are three times ours. Mm. Plus, they've got quite a viable industry that doesn't need any subsidy at all. So we can move money from these projects that are just wasting money, making things worse, immediately into investing in the Green New Deal that we need, real... Um, renewable energy, um, and also into the transport that we need as well. If we take it out of the roads, then, then we probably need to put it into uh, local, sustainable transport, walking and cycling, things that, are, things that are free and zero carbon. And the money's there to do that. This is, you know, within current budgets. And then, uh, Gary? I definitely, uh, I'm definitely up for the switch from subsidies for, you know, coal and, and gas into uh, into renewables, particularly solar, I think. Um, I think Time has, uh, time, has, time has come for a big expansion there. I suppose if I was going to pick a slightly different area, I'd say let's end the funding for free schools and let's um, use some of that money to invest in um, expanding perhaps mental health support in, um, in existing schools or, you know, given we've got a climate change theme, um, perhaps uh, again into putting those solar panels onto um, onto school school roofs. But that would be, I suppose, my my... You know, if you're wanting something different, that would be one of the things. And I pick another area, tax breaks for the well-off. Only last year, we actually voted in Parliament to, um, to, uh, lo to hide the threshold by which the, the, um, the, the, the upper um, tax payers um, pay the upper rate of tax. So somebody like me, and I earn a good amount of money, I've actually got money back. So why should somebody like me, who earns well, get a tax break when um, really families are struggling. So that's really a nonsense, and we should much more look at the low paid to give them tax breaks, but not, and uh, uh, Boris Johnson is apparently uh, proposing another tax break to the well-off. We should not do that. It's socially despicable in, in terms of, of, of social justice. So I want to take a second just to encourage everybody watching to send their own questions in. Um, so please do, because I've got another question in a second, but just quickly, we've got different ideas there. So we had. Um, cutting fossil fuel subsidies, uh, we had taking money out of free schools perhaps to support more mental health services and reducing tax breaks for the rich and there was a lot of nodding. Are the three of you all in agreement on all three of those things? We could put a budget together. Well, I think we could, that, yeah. I think we could work together on that. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly mental health spending. We just, we yeah. are appalling. Free schools, 100% behind yeah. that, yeah. And, um, Gareth, behind your proposal to stop yeah. it. Yeah, sorry. Gareth and Vera, you were at the um, you were at the first meeting of the More United Network uh, in Parliament last week, and can you just could you just take a second for More United members um, to just let them know kind of how the meeting was, um, anything you took away from it? Um, it's the first time we've had a chance to bring all of the MPs together, so I just wonder if you had any reflections on you know, whether that was uh, something that uh, perhaps energised you last week. I mean, for me, I mean, I thought it was great to see so many MPs there um, throwing ideas out uh, with the potential for sort of. Uh, cross working, um, and I think broad agreement for the for sort of five or six uh, areas. And what's been striking in the follow up since has been MPs saying, "Yeah, I want to work on that," uh, with others uh, from across uh, across the political divides. Um, and so for me, I thought that was really really interesting. I mean, in my time in Parliament, um, where a, of of late, a lot of time has been spent in opposition. If you want to get anything done. You have to try and find allies in other political uh, political parties, and to actually have a, a network like More United helping to facilitate that is is really helpful. Yes, um, so I, the public often doesn't see where we cooperate. So my first experience of cooperation was um, through the upskirting bill, and a lot of um, um, justice. Um, uh, issues are actually very consensual. So for example, we identified immediately um, that the justice system needs to be reformed um, and what do we do about, for example, short-term prison sentences. And by the way, if I wanted to put some money into something, I would probably put it into women's centers, so as an alternative to prisons. 
and that women could actually, certainly for low-level crimes for which women go into prison and their whole life is being destroyed, there would actually be um, a much better alternative. And we could put money into that. And we immediately found a way of agreement. But we also said, look, we, we understand that we come from different political parties. One of the things that are very dis is very destructive about us working together is always when we then go through voting lobbies and there is pro suddenly the party whip. So we have to sort of try and actually work around uh, when, it, when it comes to um, going to the division lobbies because that's when we divide. And actually, I did notice a report, and if this is, if this is difficult to comment on, we can move on quickly to another question. I noticed a report last week that came out that said uh, that the whips, and I, I, it was in the Observer yesterday, it said that the whipping system has a negative impact on the mental health of MPs. And there were a couple of MPs quoted in the story saying that they needed to do more, uh, that the Parliament needed to do more to support people with mental health challenges. Um, is there anything that you think, and Sean, equally, you know, you, you work in the GLA, in another difficult political environment sometimes, is there anything that you think our political institutions could be doing to lead the way a bit more on uh, supporting people when they have challenges with their mental health? I mean, we don't whip in the Green Party. Um, obviously, we only have one MP, so Caroline has to whip herself, um, but she, she doesn't. I mean, the point is we wouldn't, and Caroline is, is not... Um, bound by you know what I tell her to vote for or anything like that within within Parliament um, and within uh, bigger council groups we don't whip either we try and come to consensus um, quite often our, our councillors will rebel and I think that does make for a more healthy working relationship I know it's really alien to other parties to not have that like the party whip is very important to other parties but it is something we don't do I mean, it is I think healthier although you know we, we obviously Disagree but, sometimes. But our political culture doesn't really allow for that. Um, so, you, you know, people want to see a party and, uh, who stands for something identifiable uh, and identifiably, and then uh, if, if people go against it, and the Lib Dems are actually quite famous because we don't actually necessarily easily come together. Uh, uh, but we, th we are then immediately sort of torn to pieces because, let's say with tuition fees, I mean, let's not, not mm -hmm. really go there, but we, we voted in three ways. And that is seen as something that is a terrible discipline, this, that, and the other. And actually, we, because, uh, you know, in our party, we've got, we are a broad church, uh, whipping doesn't easily sit with liberal thinking. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, it would be an interesting debate, but I also think our... Um, our rubbish voting system um, doesn't allow for smaller parties to establish themselves and, and smaller and, and national alliances to be together and vote together. But big parties emerge, and a huge number of people with different views suddenly have to be all marched into a, a particular line. And I think that's also a problem with our voting system, and that we have got a two-party system. I didn't see the article, but I mean, <clears throat> Parliament's going to be the same as I would think as any other. Um, employment, uh, place of employment, and that there will be people who at different times have mental health issues, and there's got to be the support in place to help people deal with that. I suppose on the sort of broader question about the whipping system, I think you do have to have in place uh, a system that can demonstrate to people that government can get things done, uh, and uh, in a sense Brexit is almost the, the proof of uh, of that, in a set, uh, unfortunately, because the uh, Conservatives are, str are struggling to prove, I think, to eat to the European Union, as they argue for changes to the withdrawal agreement, that they can make that can make that happen. Now, I mean, personally, I'm comfortable with their their difficulty uh, on, on all of that because they want a different um, solution. But I do, I, you've got to have a system where government can show that it can function, and in the ultimate situation, get um, get a deal through. But you've got to manage dissent in a uh, and disagreement within a party in a, in a sensitive way, it seems to me. And I, uh, I know some people watching will be thinking government isn't currently doing a great job of showing that it can get things done, just sure. in terms of the, the mm. amount of work happening in Parliament, the amount of issues, there's not as much work happening in Parliament as we might be used to. Just quickly before we move on, Gareth, have you been a whip? Uh, I was a minister in the in the Labour, last Labour government. Okay. Um, yeah. And I suspect if you have to govern, suddenly a lot of things change actually in opposition, and most people say that opposition politics is so much easier. So having not, having not specifically done the whipping, you've ducked my next cheeky question, so you're, you're in luck there, Gareth. Okay. Um, one of the things we wanted to spend some time talking about this week is climate change. Just before we move on, thank you um, for comments coming through. We were talking about the importance of funding social care. That's something that came up last week. I just want to say to people watching that actually social care is one of the issues that MPs in the network brought up themselves in the week about something that they feel that there's probably real scope for more cross-party working on. 
Um, so thanks for those comments. Do get your questions in as well as we move to thinking about talking about climate change. Um, so one of more united values, or when we talk about what we think a more united country is, we talk about a country which looks after the environment for future generations. It's one of the five things that we think make for a more united country. So we're not interested in conversations about uh, climate change sceptics or anybody who's denying climate change. We're very much um, pro-environment in that sense. Uh, so really, I guess, in some ways, this might be a conversation about how far we can go and how fast. So Theresa May um, recently brought in a target for the government to get us to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Um, I just want to start off by asking whether that is, um, is it far enough and is it fast enough? And, uh, Sean, do you want to set the scene for us? Well, net zero is, is the right target to be aiming for. 2050 is too late. So those two things are, I mean, it's, it, is a, it is a big change for the, for the Prime Minister to have made all of a sudden. Um, and what I'm really enjoying seeing around the country is so many councils passing motions to do better. There's so many councils, over 100 councils, 50 like, principal local authorities at least have passed motions saying there is a climate emergency and we will set new targets and we will make new plans. Um, and a lot of those are choosing the target of 2030, which we think is correct. That's the one that will stop us from going over that threshold of uh, 1.5 degrees of warming, upon which we start to see um, sort of runaway climate change, um, sort of feedback effects and things like that. And that's really dangerous once we get to that point. That's what's frightening all the young people. Um, but the councils are passing motions and they're sitting down and thinking about how to get to net zero on a local basis. And there's an awful lot that can be done locally. And that's, that's what's cheering me up a little bit, because obviously things are really dire. Um, if we do not fix the, the bigger things, we fix the economy, we start fixing the big spending things within government that we were talking about, we are going to be in terrible trouble. But meanwhile, we can get local areas into sort of planning for net zero and showing it can be done. That should give courage higher up to set more fierce targets. At the moment, people feel higher up, they can't dictate to what people do lower down, but actually people in these lower tier authorities are getting very ambitious about what they can do and looking at every corner and every bit of carbon that they can drag out of what they do. And that's just, that's great, because that's what, I don't know, it's kind of what Greens are a lot about. It's a lot, it's a lot of just being conceptual. It's a bit what Lib Dems are about as well, as winning things at a council level, you know, council by council changing things, as well as trying to win all the power at Westminster, which is what our horrible first past the post system is and, all about. And, and um, our, our council in Bath and North East Somerset, because it's a combined authority, um, uh, they have set a, a, a 2030 target, but now they're starting to discuss what do we actually control. Um, and so it is obviously this debate, and we all absolutely understand the emergency, we absolutely need to be ambitious. But at some point, you also have to think, well, um, you know, what do we do with all, the, all these things that we can't currently control? Because, for example, we haven't got an alternative to jet fuel. So what are we going to do with certain industries and certain bits of, um, of, 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 of this whole picture of where we are using fossil fuels and we are, we are carbon intensive, where you know, it's, it's possibly quite difficult um, to, to squeeze out the, le the last 10%. And that is, I think, why different parties and different um, think tanks and different organisations are coming up with different targets. It's, I think it's not because people want to not be ambitious. I think the ambition is there for everybody. It's just whether people think, hmm, if we want to be realistic, does that mean we are not ambitious enough? Or if we want to be realistic, do, do we actually are we going to be taken seriously by all the players? Well, sorry. 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 So what, what's your sense? You said that 2050 is not soon enough, Sean. When, when is the realistic time that we could get? 2030. 2030. 2030. Yeah, well, I mean, the... the, the um, so we are developing um, a, a policy currently in, say, 2045. I know that doesn't sound very ambitious, but actually if you look at all the different things, and what we are saying is let's just be very tough on the interim targets. There's so many things to <coughs> do now. Um, and I, I find we can always sort of get sort of um, torn about or be not united on what is the end game. The end game, whether that's five in, in, in uh, 2045 or 2050 or 2030, <coughs> is almost less important than what are we going to do now. What are we going to do in five years' time? There are things that we can do absolutely now. The government could stop fracking now, yeah, or investing yeah. in fracking now. The government could actually say, are we going to go the electric route or are we going to go the hydrogen route? 
Is this with regard to cars? Yeah. So, so, or, or are we doing a combination? Is that um, hydrogen for bigger vehicles and electric for the for, for more personal uh, car use? If we are going that that way, what are we going to do with our heating systems? Are we going to completely phase out fossil fuels in the heating system and go all electric, or are we doing something like um, um, hydrogen with carbon capture? There are lots of decisions that need to be made very quickly because industries and ultimately industries need to help and assist need to know which okay. direction we are going. Can I just check quick, very quickly? I so I think I saw cumulative nodding on the point of stopping fracking. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's all, obvious not all, to make things even worse. Yeah. I just want to check. Sean 2030, we're at 2045. Gareth, when could we get to zero? I, don't I, I don't know, it's the truth. I mean, I think we've signed up to um, 2045, my party. Could we be bolder than that? Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure we could be as a, as a nation. But I think, I, I suppose I... I agree, wanted to agree with uh, Vera that I think what we need to do now, having set that sort of national, well, that national target having been set, is to now sort of break down by sector of the economy. Uh, how, how quickly can we de decarbonise our energy industry, uh, for example? Uh, how can we do it? Uh, how can we speed up the shift to electric um, cars? You know, where else can we get? Ultra low emission zones in place. You know, that's that's what I think we should be. So, I've got to say, I've got to say something, which is, if you look at the Committee on Climate Change reports that have happened so far towards our current budget, you can see that some of the things like the energy industry decarbonisation yeah. has moved reasonably fast. Where the government's been not bold and not tried very hard is the difficult bits where it's all stuff around the country. So we're talking about things like. Um, reducing the um, energy usage of homes, improving the energy efficiency of homes. That's kind of complicated for them to do because it's like going and sorting out all the homes. The um, transport is the other one. So trying to change people's daily journeys. A lot of car transport is huge amount, it's short journeys. And that's not been focused on by government. And that's why the local action is so exciting, because can I ask about local action can reduce our, yeah, yeah. our need for energy, can, which then is a, reduces what we need to switch. It's, it's, it's very exciting. Can I ask about urban transport? Because we, we, are, we talk a lot about cars and the need to move from diesel and petrol cars to electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles. Yeah. Um, it, within a city, there's, there's different ways of getting about, and we assume that we need to move from one type of car to another. What are your... No, no, we should. <laughs> and I think we, a lot of people yeah. assume. No, in but we need to move our journeys from cars yeah, to London. Yeah. We should, we should definitely use this as an opportunity to do a lot more. Um, and for example, look also at health benefits. So I mean, I like cycling, but not everybody does. But maybe there is um, an alternative. Um, you know, by walking or by car sharing or by actually using public transport if we improved it properly. And um, they're obviously alternative to the car travel. And I, I do believe. Um, there's a lot, there are a lot of good reasons why we should actually try and get people use their cars less. Um, and that is definitely an opportunity. And, and a lot of the green agenda, as, as we might call it, is an opportunity to also change our lifestyles and improve um, our well-being. And I saw that as a bit of town got, planning. You know, yeah. how far do you need to travel? It's not just what journeys you, you, mm. you take by which modes. It's do you need to travel far to get your basic provisions in? Well, maybe yes, because your local shops are shut. You know, there's, there's all the kinds question of issues like from, that. I've got two questions. So I've got, um, I'll let, let me give both questions. We can decide how to tackle them in a moment. I'll put to, to one side my curiosity about these scooters that I'm starting to see people <laughs> driving around town. Um, we've got a question from Sarah in Stockport who's saying, why is it always the public who are play, paying for global warming, like paying 5p for a carrier bag, when industry are the big polluters? So I want to ask first, maybe someone could suggest is that the case? You know, is it the public that are paying the brunt, or are industry doing? You know, are they taking real steps to try and tackle pollution? And I've also got a question from Barbara in Swansea, which was quickly open on my phone, which locked itself for a second there. Um, who's saying if you're putting a green tax on top of fuel tax and increasing the cost of plastic bags again, and taxing non-recyclable plastic is just excuses for making money and won't do anything to stop the pollution. So there's a couple of questions there, both sort of suggesting that consumers are getting hit with small fees, but surely this is a big, large-scale problem. I, th I think you need to do both. So, I mean, I'm struck by the 5p on um, plastic bags, which I think is happening across the UK now. There's been a sharp reduction, a really significant reduction in, uh, in the amount of plastic bags being, um, being used. And, you know, and I feel the change in behaviour in my own house um, as a result. But I think um, you know, Barbara's point is right in that um, we've got to do more, and this is the point coming back to subsidies for fossil fuels, shift those, uh, those subsidies away um, from those huge polluting industries. And actually, 
use them to invest in other renewable technologies like solar panels that are not quite yet economically uh, viable or offshore wind, uh, which are technologies of the future, but which are slightly more expensive than other forms of energy at the moment. I mean, you, you might have noticed well, earlier, I, I, I'm really enraged about tax breaks for, for, for the rich. So mm. the social injustices and, and, the, and the inequality gap that's rising and rising is one of the things that, that, that really I, I'm sure we all agreed on. And so the transition has to be socially just. We must make sure that the people who can least afford it will not have to pay the, the, the biggest burden of it. And, 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 and that has to be done properly. And again, decisions have to be made quite quickly, the direction of how we go. So is actually the public sector paying most of the big costs of, of the transition, or are we leaving it all to the private sector? And then guess what? It's the, the, the people who can least afford it who have the highest burden. So I, I do believe uh, we will have to have big discussions and big political divides over who is picking up the costs, and is it the public sector or the private sector? And with sector. the private sector, because uh, I've got another question, and Melody Davis is asking a similar question around how much cross-party working we can expect towards a uh, reduction of single-use plastics, but also notably, she says, asking big business to do more. So another question about big business. Now, with big business, should is this a carrot job? Do we need to incentivise them to do more so that, that, so that we can pluralise the economy and create more jobs? Or is it a stick thing where they're just never going to do what we ask them to, so we need to have harsher regulation, which is more You, you have to remember that our, our, that our big businesses are also big employers, and that is often, or you know, most of them are, I mean, I mean we're not going to talk about um, online and, and Facebook and Amazon, but let's say our, our car manufacturers, if we don't have them sort of on board, they can always um, pressurise the government about job losses and now they can't do this that, and the other, which is why, of course, governments allow themselves to actually, well, be pressurised. And, and, <coughs> and, and it, is a, it is a bit of a fine balance because they are employers. It's a great example of that um, uh, Lady Bryony Worthington, who's one of my um, colleagues in the House of Lords, came up with uh, from Norway, where the need to reduce emissions from shipping, um, accepted across uh, industry and across Norwegian society, big threat from the Norwegian government that they impose a tax. Instead, the industry came together and said, look, let us, instead of taxing us yet, let's, let us put money into a pot to invest in alternatives to the uh, carbon polluting fuels that we're, we're coming up with at the moment. And that has galvanized uh, change, it's galvanized research. And so you need the stick, the threat of the stick, but you also need to create, um, create incentives to, to shift things around, I think, and it's gonna be, trying to find innovations like that as quickly as we can do, uh, which hopefully might uh, help to reduce the need for some of the, the big spending that at the moment it looks like is going to be necessary. Sean, where have you seen business do well on this? What more can you think can be done? So, I mean, when it comes to, when you, I mean, this idea that you keep putting things on the consumer level mm. just does drive me a little bit mad. Okay. Um, because it isn't, you know, it shouldn't be up to you to go and hunt out the one thing in the supermarket that's not pa packaged in plastic. Sure. We really do need to be getting the, the manufacturers to, to pay the tax on the plastic at source. And in fact, then they'll stop using plastic. Yeah. Um, I went to an excellent, excellent factory in Cumbria that's a paper mill that makes paper out of paper, doesn't make it out of trees. Um, and they were collecting up as many coffee cups as they possibly could from the big chains, trying to get them to come to bring it in at, the, at source at the shop, so rather than the bins that go to the council, which are very, very poor at re recycling those. And they were turning them into paper, but they were also turning them into essentially packaging. So like trays to hold things in that are just pressed paper. They'll last as long as they need to, to hold things like um, punnets of fruit, or um, they were using for, for the trays that phones come in, lots of quite high tech bits of packaging. Um, the shop Lush, I'm not going to advertise Lush on this, am I? But anyway, the shop Lush is buying like, BBC, um, yeah. packaging yeah. That, that, that is made entirely of this pressed paper that would normally, because it's stiff, it would normally be used as plastic. Now, if you put that tax onto the manufacturers, they'll use these innovations pretty quickly. Um, like you said, the creativity will kick in. And then people won't be having to hunt around and do all, do all the work. That's what that drives me mad. To give another example, and uh, another bit of an advert, but without the commercial uh, side of things. Other shops are available. <laughs> uh, had, we set up in Harrow uh, a half marathon and a, and a family mile. And last year we banned single-use plastics mm. from the first event to do that in, um, in London. And um, people got used very quickly to the, uh, to the alternative. We're going to be doing that the, uh, again. You know, why couldn't something like the London Marathon, uh, you know, follow the example of, say, Glastonbury this year and 
Harrow, the Harrow Half Marathon and say, no more single plastics. Add a single use plastics, add a stroke, you're creating an incentive for others to come into the market and provide uh, water to people, you know, that most basic of things in a, uh, in a, different, in a different way. And can I ask just quickly, because I know, I think I'm correct in saying uh, that you once brought forward a bill to try and introduce a smoking ban well before the smoking ban was actually introduced, is that right? I did. Do you think there's any lessons from the, the kind of gap between when you were saying that that might be a good idea to when the Department of Health said it was a good idea that, that can be applied to how you bring behaviour change about and climate change? Um, you know, absolutely. I mean, the more you have, uh, you give publicity to examples of people making the case for, for change, whether it's, you know, Lush or, um, in our case, in our, our sort of half marathon, you know, the, the better. Um, and, I mean, I, th I think we should have targets for, um, you know, solar panels on every school roof, on every new house that gets built. Um, again, as part of the way of incentivising change that much uh, that much quicker. I mean, we, we, we are sort of talking about more united, how you can unite politicians, but also how can politicians unite with the public. So we are talking a lot about citizens' assemblies. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for the really divisive issues, um, and I know we are not really talking about Brexit, but to avoid something like Brexit, we should really, really um, hold citizens' assemblies about a number of really, um, you know, quite difficult issues mm -hmm. and, and educate the public well. Outside the party political ding-dong, outside the media screaming, people can actually make very good decisions with, when they're presented with a full range of facts. And I think that should be one of the, the ways of bringing the public together as well. So big shout out to everybody listening to kind of get more involved in decision making, which I'm sure they'll all be on board with. Just want to ask one last question, um, just before we wrap up, which is to say that it was Glastonbury this weekend. Um, and I'm interested to know, were either of you, any of you, all of you, to headline Glastonbury, what sort of set would we expect? Would we be? Would, you know, would it be noodling on the bass guitar? Would it be a fantastic virtuoso singing performance? What would be your Glastonbury headlining moment? I'm well, without question, not least uh, musical person in the room. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> I'm currently with my four-year-old and two-year-old trying to teach them uh, Welsh rugby songs, and that's my uh, my heritage. So, there's this wonderful uh, Welsh uh, hymn, "Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah," which. Uh, Booms out every time Wales, in particular, play in England, and what better place than Glastonbury for that? Vera, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. A sing along that would be great. Exactly. Come on, what, what, and with what song would you lead? Ooh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> um, I, I just heard the other day Pet Shop Boys were actually there with them. Um, they were with the Killers. They were, they were there, and they were there with them. Um, you, you, you're always on my mind. I think, my God. Surely, we, I'm not that old, am I, you know, but, but it is last century, all that sort of stuff, so what was it that, that really got us go, going and dancing, you know, I'm bad, I'm bad, you know, Madonna, something like that? And Sean, is it safe to say you're more likely to be found on the dance floor than on the stage? Um, yes, probably. Um, just to say, my dad was a rugby player, it's not, it's, he, when, he used, when he was younger, um, and there's a tape of me singing, Pontypool Front Row somewhere, which is quite dramatic. So maybe I'd, maybe I'd sing that. I, 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 I range between a, a, a hymn um, and some really good dance music, I have to say. It could be anything. I, can, I think we're, yeah, I think we're collectively ensuring we're never going to be asked back to do that. I can almost a thing. hear the keys Latest, clattering yeah. on the people's Google search looking for that video right now. So before, uh, just before we go, thanks draw. to everybody for watching the second episode of The Crossbench. Thank you to Vera, Gareth and Sean for joining us. We'll be back again same time next week but for now um, please do keep an eye out in your inbox for details on next week and thanks for watching